Manifold Contact, in association with Mitsubishi Motors, drive your ambition. Hello and welcome to Brian Moore's Full Contact with the Telegraph and Mitsubishi Motors. Well, England are into the final of the inaugural Autumn Nations Cup after seeing off Wales in what was, frankly, a largely forgettable affair. Eddie Jones once again opted for the power game and ground down a resilient Welsh defence to get the victory. That sees their side into the final. Now, if you thought Saturday's affair was going to be a damp squib, Sunday's final could follow suit because it's emerged that most of the French top players will not be released by their clubs. Take on England. They've named an inexperienced squad for Sunday's final. We'll be speaking to Thomas Castagnier, uh, the former French international, about the state of French rugby and also about the tragic passing of his former teammate Christophe Dominici, who died last week, just aged 48. Newcastle Falcons are next to the only two sides with a 100% record left in the Gallic Premiership after two weeks. The Falcons saw off sale on Friday with a kick in added time. He's speaking to their head coach Dave Walder about the perfect start of the season and what it's like to go over 250 days without playing a competitive game. And we'll be taking a closer look at some of the work being done at grassroots level during the last seven months as part of the Mitsubishi Volunteer Recognition Programme. This week, we'll be giving away six tickets to our volunteer for Sunday's Autumn Nations Cup Final Clash with France. And alongside me today is the former London Irish and England winger, star of star screen and radio now, Top City Ojo. Well, 13, England 24, another win, non-spectacular. But, um, I mean, what do you make of that? Yeah, it was an interesting one, wasn't it? Being down there, like watching it live. Um, it was England doing what they've done over the course of this Autumn's Nation Cup, which is kick very well, chase very well, have this very brutal defence and be an absolute menace at the breakdown. Um, I thought at parts in the first half, there were shades that England might open up a bit, but it didn't quite happen. Ultimately, they went back to tried and tested, squeezed Wales a bit, even when it looked like Wales might come into it a bit, and they did what they have done with this competition, which is effectively bully teams, pressure them, force mistakes, force turnovers, and ultimately win the game that way based off their defence. So, they were, they were, they were, I mean, they were also the recipients of a couple of dodgy... I mean, look, I like Poit, I think he's a decent referee, everyone makes mistakes, but England were the beneficiaries of a couple of decisions they shouldn't have had, really. Yeah. Um, I, I think they would have still won anyway, um, but I mean, when, when Pivak said afterwards, he'll be speaking to World Rugby about the performance. Um, you, I, I got the feeling that England had another gear or several gears if they needed. Yeah, well, I, I think this is the story. Maybe we'll come on to it later. But none of the teams they've played so far have really pushed them to find that extra gear. If at any point the game has maybe looked a bit sticky, they've said, right, back to process, kick, chase, tackle, defend, win, breakdown, turnovers. So nobody's forced them to evolve their attacking game or any other facets of their game. They're winning, they're winning very comfortably, so they haven't really had to do too much. I think they did get the benefit of some decisions. I think the uh, the damn bigger tackle, definitely. But like you say, I, I don't think it would have affected the result too much. I think England would have had too much to win that game. I mean, Ian McGee could, and indeed I have written uh, before the Telegraph that the, 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 the tactics used recently seem to us to reflect back to the way in which England got beaten by beaten up by South Africa and the determination to signal to themselves and everyone else, look, and whatever, well, this is not going to happen to us again. You know, we, you if you if you if you think you're going to beat us physically, that's not going to happen. But I I was made the point that what I'd like to see them do is because you can't just turn this on and off. In my opinion, yes, make yourselves difficult to beat in terms of power and strength. But if you major just on that, then when you get beaten in that, you'll get beaten. Because you don't have the extra, you don't have the extra dimensions to overcome that. And one thing that can overcome brute power is pace and you know creativity. So I'd just like them to see when they've got on the foot on the throat of teams, is to take that opportunity then to say, right, we can do other things as well. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that's what we'd all like to see. I mean, the South Africa one's interesting. I think Eddie would have taken a lot of lessons from that, and you can see mirrors of that in the way England are playing now. I guess what I would say is South Africa played that way throughout the tournament and New Zealand beat them in game one by showing that you can attack against that style of play. If your attack is good, if you've got good shape, if you've got the skills and I guess the temperament to want to play against that sort of defence, then you can cause it problems. I think, you know, 
it would be great to see England say if they have the game won 50, 60 minutes just to take the opportunity to open up. I mean, this weekend, this is their last game of the year before Six Nations. So yeah. if the game is wrapped up, take the opportunity to be a bit carefree in that last 20 minutes to evolve your gameplay, to try a few things with little consequence, knowing that at some stage, somebody will match them for power. Yeah. And then as we probably saw in that final, right, the game plan that they did against New Zealand wasn't working. Was there a clear plan B? There probably wasn't. And that might happen come the next Six Nations. So mm. you've got this last game to kind of develop something different. Um, for Wales, um, I mean, a bit more encouragement in the sense that I think this was the first in several games where I saw the old commitment that Wales used to have in defence, definitely there, and they held England, but um, didn't see much else. I mean, that, that is something to build on. But I, I, I wonder if you can see any other rays of hope for, for Wayne Pivak at the moment. Aside from that, no, I, I think it's, it's very tough for them. Uh, we know they're evolving um, and you kind of have to take small wins. I think defence was one of them definitely early on. They were making some big hits. Uh, I was really pleased for Johnny Williams. I think former teammate, given the year he's had, um, he pretty much led that defence in, in that 12 shirts. Really big hits. I think he ticked off Mako and Billy um, and... He scored the try as well, which kind of gave Wales that little self-belief that they've not really had. Um, I think after this weekend, you would hope for an improved performance, but it's back to the drawing board. I, I think they need to find the squad and the combinations that are going to take them forward for the long term. I, I think with Wayne Pivak coming in with a, a lot of the old guard and a lot of the new guard, it's getting that balance of who's who can I mould into my style of play? Because... The, the guys he has at the moment are so used to Gatland and so used to winning that way. So it's very difficult for a coach to come in and change things and say, right, I know you were successful this way, but this is my philosophy. I mean, to be I fair to them, they've got a whole change in personnel uh, in the background. And then you've got decisions to make, like Alan Wynne Jones, he's not going to make the next World Cup. A um, hugely significant figure. At what point do you say, thanks, Alan Wynn, you know, with all these things... Um, and then you've got a raft, as you say, you've got a raft of players who are just on that side. Um, uh, Tipperick is one. I mean, Tipperick is a great player. Um, you've got to decide, well, is he there? Is he not for, for the future? And they, these, are, these are not easy decisions. People have found that. And the unfortunate thing for Wales is they've got a raft of them to make. It's not just one or two. Yeah, this is, this is very <laughs> difficult. This is not good succession planning, by the way, because this one shouldn't happen. <laughs> no, I mean, and this... this these are the uncomfortable conversations and thoughts that Pivak's going to have to have. You know, even speaking about Jolly Williams, you know, he's got uh, John Davis to come back in. You know, does John Davis come back in because he is John Davis or has Johnny Williams done enough now to say, actually, no, I'm the future 12 in the Welsh shirt? Yep. You know, same with uh, young James Bothan and Wainwright. You know, we've got good young back rowers, but they've got Tipperick and Navidi as well. So those are the sort of conversations. It's yeah. a balance between not letting all that experience go, but working out a smooth transition so that we're talking World Cup 2023 and beyond, these guys are battle-hardened and ready. Talking about the game to come on Sunday, uh, we are fortunate enough to have Thomas Castanier, former French international. Uh, uh, Thomas, hello. Bonjour. Bonjour. Well, now, look, the, the fact that the... Uh, the side to face England is going to be very inexperienced. Uh, a lot of second string, no, no, Dupont, Olivon, Bakatawa, they're not not going to be there. This is not a straightforward thing, is it? Because before this series of games, I think I'm right in saying that um, Bernard Laporte wanted the federation wanted six games. Um, the clubs offered five. They came to a compromise that they could have them, but they could only play in three of the games. And now. The, the, it, had they played it, it would have been the fourth one. So there are allegations of bad faith, both sides pointing fingers at each other. Where, who do you think is at fault here? Well, I think that's a that's a big concern, you know, for for for, for, for of course for French rugby because well, we got this. Um, it's not an opposition, but it's um, it's the way I think French rugby is organised and, and, and is balanced. Uh, you got the clubs who have many, who got lots of power because they pay uh, the players, and then you got the federation. You know, would like to have the players more and more. You know, and to use them. You know, to play at international 
international level and of course to to improve their level um but with this uh, covid uh, and this uh, coronavirus we the clubs you know couldn't use the players as they wanted and they still had to pay them you know and uh, so the um, there was an agreement that was made to protect the clubs because the clubs uh, could die you know or could uh, could could um, could end up you know if nothing if 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 the players are not playing in the club because the supporters won't be there because the results won't be there and at the same time you got big games with the french federation where uh, the more games you participate you know the the, the, the better you are and you're improving um, but i think the federation you know has used the players and has has considered that there were a certain amount of, of games who could be played and uh, and the club did, did, didn't want you know all these games to be played so we had only an agreement you know on few, on, on less games for the federation mm-hmm. and in the end we arrive at this crazy situation where uh, the, the best players cannot play uh, against the best team in the tournament so that's a bit strange yeah because i mean i would say people saying Look, it's a one-off uh, series. They're saying that's not a good attitude to take to potential broadcasters and sponsors that you want yeah, to but, come uh, on later. Yeah, but every, everyone knew that, you know, from the start, and everyone knew what was the rules, you know, used by the French, uh, uh, by, by by the French Federation with the clubs, and that was an agreement. Uh, the biggest difference you have in English rugby, and I think you are close to our our type of uh, organization, is. You own Twickenham, and when you make games at Twickenham, I think you make much more money than what we do in French rugby, and that's why the Federation has got so much power. Mm-hmm. In France, that's not the same, you know. So I think the clubs are more powerful, and and they, you know, they, the Federation, you know, they have to balance and to organize themselves, you know, to to have the players. So I think the stupidity is to have like club games at the same time as international games, and yep. uh, as long as we don't solve that, you know, there will be issues all the time. Look, it's been a while since we've spoken to anyone connected with a French side. Uh, what have you made over the past year of the what people are calling the resurgence? How close are they to being a very good team, the French? I never thought that we were going to come back so quickly. Um, we're not back, you know, to the highest level, but I think now. When teams are playing against France, they got some fears, and uh, I'm pretty sure that the, the, the French team now is back, you know, into into a great level. But the most important thing is we are back with a certain philosophy. We got some style. We got the intensity, you know, for the highest level. And I think the coaching staff with Fabien Galtier, Raphael Ibanez, um, you know, by by bringing Sean Edwards, you know, with a massive organization in defense, they brought a different view, you know, on on how rugby has to be played. And um, I, I'm really convinced that we are really on the right way and, and maybe we are in advance, you know, on what we want to create. And um, we had so many bad years in the, in, the last, in the last 10 years that now I think this is the time with the quality of, with quality players too and uh, and numbers of players who can play for the French team. I think there's, there's something to do, definitely. Uh, Thomas, just one last question. Obviously, we're watching a lot of French rugby now. I'm really impressed with how they're going. What chances do you give them for 2023? You'll be the home team. You'll have the home crowds behind you as well, hopefully a COVID-free time when fans will be swarming all the stadiums. What do you make of France's chances? I think I think if if the French team can play against the best teams like New Zealand, England, um, Australia, South Africa, you know, if they can play a lot of games, you know, at the highest level, then they they will be um, um, they will be. Uh, um, able uh, to claim something for the World Cup, um, and, uh, and and results, you know, will be really important, and to, and to have like not only one result, you know, but to have like um, uh, um, um, a series of, of of wins, you know, is very important. But the quality of the individualities is there, and and these guys, uh, by playing in European Cup, by playing against the best teams, they can show that individually they can they can compete against the best. But now as a team. They need to mix together and to gel and to understand what will be uh, the, um, the desire of the coaching staff. But but uh, the coaching staff seems to have a, a, a good view, you know, about how modern rugby has to be played. And 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 the organization now is there. We've got the intensity. I'm I'm, I'm pretty sure that to, in two, 2023 week we we want we will be one of the possibilities, and we won't see France, you know, as a as a team who cannot win the World Cup, but we will be able to do something in this competition. Uh, finally, Tom, I looked at the awful news that shocked uh, not just French rugby, but world rugby, the sudden passing of your former international teammate Christophe uh, Dominici. Now, um, the circumstances uh, are not good around this. Uh, you, I mean, you've not been talked about, but it, 
uh, not not you know awful. So I'd like you to 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 top, comment if you would on the positives of the, of the man. What you remember him as a man as a player? Um, he he was not he was not only a, a player uh, and and uh, someone who, who, who you know we I played with. He he was a friend, and I would always remember you know uh, first of all the first time he was not selected, but uh, when he was, came for training with the French team, uh, we we were going on a small island you know in front of Toulon on a, on, a, on a boat and. So he, he was someone who, who didn't talk so much, you know, but uh, but but you know he was so intense and so um, he had so much desire. Uh, and his leadership was strong, and as a then you know uh, games after games, you know he showed what kind of player he was and the character he had. Um, I would always remember, you know, the time we spent together, you know, in the rooms before before the games with all his uh, determination and uh, how. Uh, um, um, uh, he was convinced, uh, you know, that we were going to win, and how much he brought to the team. It's it's a massive, massive uh, loss uh, for the family of French rugby and family of uh, world rugby because uh, there was only one Dominici, you know, and uh, he's, uh, it's it's uh, it's hard to believe uh, that uh, that uh, we have lost uh, someone like like him, and, um, and we are so um, um, depressed, you know, by by this news. Uh, Tom, uh, thank you very much for your comments on uh, Christophe and indeed on, on French rugby. Uh, take care of yourself. Have a good Christmas. Yeah, à bientôt. Bye-bye. À bientôt. Uh, Topsy, um, this, this, this row uh, about who is on isn't playing, I understand both sides of this argument. The club's saying, look, we had an agreement and you broke it because you, you, you arranged the Welsh fixture and you then played a full-strength thing. You didn't need to, etc. But... My point is this, in COVID times, this tournament was thrown together with a background of desperation because you had to get something in there. You had to get some broadcast money. Otherwise, all the federations, all the unions were going to lose even more money. Now, to say to um, a potential sponsor, no, the actual sponsor, Amazon, and and then um, by extension to other sponsors, uh, we'll give you a property and then it'll be devalued because we've got an internal row which we, we can't control. That's not a good thing. And I just think on this occasion, the French clubs, because they've not got crowds anyway, could have just said, you know, could have just said, look, all right, for the sake of this tournament, for getting it through and having some um, authenticity, we'll, we'll, this once, we'll let you break this agreement. But, you know, this is the last, you know, you, you remember this and we, we want to mark it down. But the whole thing to me has gone by the board almost. Yeah, it's a re- it's a real shame because... You know, I didn't realise that the warm-up game counted as well. So obviously the game finished at the weekend. I thought, right, brilliant. DuPont will be back in. Untermat, Ramos, all these guys for a big final. We're actually in for a showpiece. Lo and behold, actually the agreement extends. So maybe from the French Federation's point of view, they maybe shouldn't have wasted them in that first game. So now Amazon don't have their star team that they would like to have seen. Um, But again, given the times we're in at the moment, you'd like to think... People could have got around the table, discussed it, said, look, this is for the good of French rugby as a whole. It's a one-off situation. Everybody's adapting. Let's make the best decision for both club and country. Ultimately, this infighting has led to the situation we have now, whereby France are going to send a good team, but an understrength team, not a first team, to Twickenham, trying to win a trophy. And we think of where France have progressed over the last year. How good would this have been if they could have rolled up to Twickenham on Sunday and won and beaten England? What statement does that give them going forward? So, Messi, unfortunately, uh, we don't have that first team, but I know that the, whichever French team turns up will be 100% committed. Well, and I always take this point. Um, people talking about, uh, well, we haven't got the players. Players get better playing international rugby. They don't get worse. They, they, you know, it's, it's arguable. Well, it's, to me, no, it's, it's unarguable. The international rugby is harder than than, than club rugby. Uh, certainly, no, not necessarily physically sometimes, but with all that's involved, you know, the, the pace, the reaction times, just the different settings. And the more players play for the country, the better they get when they go home. Absolutely. You're only going to improve dealing with those pressures, maybe more pressure in a smaller time frame. So it just puts your decision making under pressure and... You can't say that that's not a bad thing for a player looking to develop, looking to improve, yeah. looking to take what he's learnt back to his clubs to make himself better all around. It's a win-win situation. So 
to almost deny players that opportunity again to go and test themselves against the what second best team in the world it's an opportunity missed i guess the good thing is that it will help front in terms of depth in terms of new players now here we go here's england at twickenham you couldn't ask for a tougher game right now in the world let's see what you're made of full contact in association with mitsubishi motors everyone's ambitions are different you can climb to the top or you could take on uphill battles of a different kind. You can explore for hundreds of miles. Or you could begin a bigger journey. You can make time fly. Or you could make it stand still. The Mitsubishi SUV range. Drive your ambition. In partnership with England Rugby, Mitsubishi Motors runs a volunteer recognition programme to provide the rugby community with opportunities to recognise and reward the volunteers who are the heartbeat of the game. Throughout the autumn, in association with Mitsubishi, I will be chatting with a selection of rugby volunteers to hear their stories and shine a light on the brilliant work they've done during these most challenging of times. And my guests for the sixth instalment are Josh Forrester Rodway and Nicky Savory from Chosen Hill. RFC. Josh, you started the Bick for Bob head shaving challenge to commemorate Bob Savory, a club legend at Chosen Hill, who sadly lost his life to COVID. Can you tell me a bit more about Bob and why you chose to commemorate him? Well, he was just like a huge sort of like person in like, not only like for like us as a like, as a club, it was us as like a community really. Because yeah. he like, he was just like a he was just a man that got on with everyone and like he never had a bad word to say about anyone. So he thought for all he's done, it's not much that he can give back to sort of like celebrate his life in a way. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, but, but what, why why head shaving as a, as a method of fundraising? I'm not sure because it was just like, <laughs> it was just like a, like a thing at the time. It was just like, like shave your head, like... It was just, obviously couldn't have a haircut anyway, so yeah. just shave it off. Is it true that Bob's daughter, Nikki, agreed to have her head shaved? She raised 10 grand? Uh, I think it was about 16. Oh, my word. 16 <laughs> grand. And I mean, what's so, what, yeah. what it, what it meant to you and the club to to have raised such a large sum in, in, in his memory? Well, I've got my head around it, really. <laughs> it's just more of a thing of what I've helped out with I know they've obviously used that for I, I don't know but I know they'll use it well well look I mean it's been a tremendous initiative really. it's going to help all sorts of people and, and, and Mitsubishi Motors have been really touched by your story <laughs> They, you know, and I agree that you've shown uh, courage, determination and hard work during a difficult time raised considerable amount of money and what they want to do in recognition of your efforts Mitsubishi Motors said, I'd like to gift you tickets to the final of the Autumn Nations Cup. So how does Sunday England-France at Twickenham sound to you? Oh my God, that sounds amazing. Well, they're yours, mate. We'll arrange, we'll arrange you to get there and you know, we'll, we'll arrange the tickets to get you there and everything. So look, good things happen to good people. I'm so pleased that, uh, that they found you. You better go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I will. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> All right, mate. Look, it's, it's not it's not always easy to react to these, but this is this is what you get if you volunteer. Sometimes, sometimes people understand, and uh, Mitsubishi Motors have seen yours, and they are very, and we are very impressed. So, thank you very much. Just to chip in from me, we as a family can't express our gratitude enough for Fridge. He was, and I will say this, I'll say it to his face. Um, he was so reluctant to get his head shaved, honestly, and I think that's what got the ball rolling and we can't even express our gratitude for everything that Fridge did um basically humiliate himself and my dad would have been most pleased that he looked absolutely disgusting as well <laughs> um, so you know we just we just wanted to express our gratitude for that and in terms of the Cheltenham and Gloucester Hospitals charity yep. um we've received notification that the money has directly gone into the staff um they've um had a huge amount of um, th those funds raised have gone into the well-being of the staff. No amount of money can thank them. And uh, we're continuing to raise money for them throughout the winter. The club is getting involved. 
um, with another initiative. So we're, you know, we're doing everything we can to repay them. Okay, look, uh, Josh, Nikki, you've been great. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much. You, Take care. Thank you. Well, for more details about the Mitsubishi Motors Volunteer Recognition Programme with England Rugby, visit www.englandrugby.com forward slash participation forward slash volunteers forward slash. Let's turn to the, uh, well, newly started Gallagher Premiership. You were at Brentford Community Stadium. It's not very, not very imaginative. <laughs> title but London Irish it's a new stadium what's it like it's brilliant it is really good like especially after yesterday so having been there a few times to see it when it was open and to see the facilities and everything to have been there yesterday for a a live game I mean I know the very first time I went I tried to picture what it would look like fans in the building and how good it would be and kind of that atmosphere and buzz there was a small sense of that yesterday in terms of there being an actual premiership game there the first one um I now look forward to when fans are in there because, you know, the seats are brilliant. You're very close to the pitch as well, but quite high up. So I, from wherever you're sat, you'll have a good view of things. Uh, it, it could get quite hostile in there, I think. Well, for those of you who don't necessarily know where this is, if you come on into London on the M4 and you get to the elevated section, do you remember where the old LucasAid advert used to be on the side of the building? If you look right and look down, it's in a, a patch of ground which I wouldn't have thought was big enough. But it's a fantastic stadium. That's that's where you can see it from from the road, um, and it's going to be well. It's going to be that it's going to be good for the London Irish fans to get. No, no, there's nothing wrong with Reading itself. It's just a long way from London. Yeah, uh, it's more just sorry, just accessibility. I think more than anything, you know, Reading was brilliant for us, but it did feel like you were travelling out. This one being so close to the centre of London, tube stations all around it, M4 right behind you as well. There's almost no excuse not to come down and come take a game in. So really pleased that it kicked off well yesterday. We'll see what the future holds from there. Well, good win against Leicester. I mean, what would be a successful season for Irish? Stay up. Well, ultimately, look, yeah, ultimately, that, I'd, that is the ultimate yeah, thing. Yeah, I'd say it? bottom prize, staying up, a successful season, probably Champions Cup rugby. Mm-hmm. I think finishing in the top six, you know, that would make a huge statement of the club moving forward. You know, it would bring top class European rugby back into central London as well. And it would be a great advertisement for the club as well. You know, look what we're building. Look at the stadium facilities, players, tournaments. It would ha- massively help the club grow. I'd still be interested in your view on this. Without crowds, to compensate for moments... See, I've had this thing for a long time and people... No one listens. But I've said, look, when you're broadcasting, you've, there's always something taking your attention. You're always analysing. I said, you go and sit in the crowd as a member of the crowd without a ref link and see how much the game stops when there's nothing going on and you're waiting for scrums to form, for lineouts to form, for this to happen, the other. And I said... Until you do that, you don't understand what the actual experience is for spectators. And it stops far too much. Because when you're involved in the broadcast, there's always things going on, so your attention is always there. Uh, To me, the COVID situation has brought it home starkly when you haven't got crowds to compensate in the background as to what does and doesn't work in rugby. And there's certain things that do, the things that don't. And one of the things for me is the avoidable breaks, the discussions before lineups, the discussions before scrums and so on, which leave people completely cold. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. that There's definitely moments in the game where it can be sped up and, you know, the amount of time lost to reset scrums, reset lineouts. I mean, I guess it, it is more noticeable now, you know, when you're in the media and you're working or you're broadcasting, you're talking about something that's happened, you're looking at replays, you're discussing tactics and what might happen. If you're sat in the crowd, you're just watching. And normally you're talking to someone, but actually you're just watching and nothing's happening. Everyone's at home at the minute, kind of waiting, saying, right, when is play going to resume? So I think there's merit on looking at ways in which we can speed up the game. I mean, I know the referees are trying to stop the clock now a bit more, but it's... The problem with stopping the clock, Topsy, is this, is that people think, well, it doesn't matter because we'll make the time up. But as a watcher... You're still, nothing's happening. It's the same time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's the same time. So things like that. I mean, there's one thing maybe I'm enjoying about the women's game at the minute in terms of you know, free kicks for knock-ons. So you know it's fast. You know, the game keeps flowing. It's quite continuous, quite high-paced. Maybe there's an idea there. I don't know. Yeah. Well, uh, let's talk to someone 
who has also made a very successful start uh, in this uh, Gallagher Premiership. Pleased to say I was able to speak to Dave Walder, the Newcastle Falcons head coach. Hello, Dave. Hi there, how are you doing? Not too bad. Uh, how's Dino? Yeah, he's all right. He's all right, hobbling away. Good man. <laughs> does, he still look, does he still look scruffy in anything that he wears? Oh, he scrubs up all right, doesn't he? Yeah. He's got to be careful. <laughs> got to be careful as well. <laughs> no, he's, uh, he's, he's not too fussed, is he, really? Look, you went over 250 days without a competitive game. Yeah. Um, how was that, first of all? And how was it that you managed to get two wins out of two? Um, you know, what's the secret? Yeah, well, I wish I, wish I knew. I think, I think the first, to answer the first, uh, the first question, we didn't really know um, what, when, like a lot of things, when the world was going to start up again. And I mean the rugby world, not the world in general, because obviously that's still in slow motion, sat on hold. Um, I think from our side of it, initially when we the, the, the season finished, and it was then the, it was a couple of weeks before it was confirmed that we were promoted. So then we had the excitement of looking forward to uh, a Premiership season, albeit not sure when it was going to begin. And then there was the first we heard was that they were going to scrap last season in the Premiership. This year's Premiership is going to start in August, so we probably had a month where we weren't training because everyone was furloughed and we were away, and everyone was in lockdown. But you had the excitement of a bit of light at the end of the tunnel, and as that. Oh, so after about a month, it became clear that that wasn't going to be the case. And then it became a case of it was indefinitely. So I think a lot of lads lost their way a little bit, lost a bit of focus inevitably. Um, we then started back in once the premiership season was resumed. We started our stage one training. But again, there was a, it wasn't confirmed until a couple of weeks after. Um, the, long, the long and short, I'm sort of long-winded story, we didn't really know what was going on. So we, we took a best guess that our season would start around the middle of November. And then that eventually got confirmed. So we worked back from there to try and give the lads, I guess, eight weeks of, of decent work heading into it. Um, the two games we played against Ely, one her, the first one away and the second one at home were vital in terms of getting the boys, giving the boys a little bit of a hit out. But even then, we were a bit unsure of how things were going to go. Um, and then I think um, we've just sort of hit the ground probably a little bit faster than we maybe thought we would. What's the realistic target for this year? Uh, good question. I think we you know we've looked at our squad and we've looked at there's two ways that you can look at it. You can go, well, everyone else is battle hardened, et cetera, et cetera, and everyone else got a bit more money than us in slightly larger squads. But we've gone, we viewed it that because everyone's played a lot of rugby with smaller squads with the international calendar being extended, we should hopefully be able to keep the majority of our lads together. And if we can do that, we're pretty confident that we can sort of try and get eighth, eighth, ninth in the league. Um, I think anything higher than that's a bonus in your first year back from the championship. Um, and I think that's probably where we got our sights set. Well, Dave, two wins out of two. You now head to last year's beaten finalist Wasps. So what have you got planned for that? A feet firmly off the ground, expecting them to bounce back after their loss as well? Or you, you think you're feeling confident going down there? Oh, I mean, I think, as you said, they're the beaten finalists and they're probably one referee call away from maybe winning it. Um, and I think they, they had momentum at the end of the season. We, we sort of looked at our first three fixtures and we said we know, we'll know far more where we're at after the three of them. So we played three of the top five sides, um, two of them away from home. So we said we'll know a lot more. The first two have provided their own uh, different different tests. Wasps are an exciting group and the way what Lee Blackett's done there has been brilliant. They play a great style uh, of rugby. They've got a lot of ball players in their back line to move the ball and they've got some outstanding finishers out wide. So, you know, they, they'll play a game that will, um, will challenge us from our side of it. I think we've... Um, We've ground out a couple of wins in terms of a certain style. From my side, it would be nice to see us playing uh, a little bit more rugby um, whilst still having one eye on the pragmatic side of the game and ultimately go down there with not a lot to lose. We're the team that's come up um, from last year and are playing against the team that got beaten in the final. And I say we're probably two minutes away from winning it. Dave, we don't speak enough to uh, people from Newcastle, so thank you very much uh, for coming on and speaking to us. Hope to speak to you again soon. Yeah, great. Thanks for the time. Thanks for your time. Well, some questions, Topsy, from from, uh, from listeners. Teams appear to use kick and chase as a preferred transition from defence to attack, as it currently carries the lowest risk versus highest potential reward. Uh, given the improved player attitudes, etc., um, what would you say could be changed to create time and space on the pitch? This is the flavour of, of the month at the minute. I mean, to be honest with you, I've thought about this a lot and I actually think attacks just need to improve. 
I think there is enough in the game at the minute. You know, we saw it in the Gallagher Premiership over the weekend. Teams can play well and can score points. England were doing this, I guess, what, nine, a year now, back at the World Cup, playing some of the best rugby we've ever seen them play. And that is the same group of players. So for me, it's a mentality about how you want to approach the game. I think at the moment, a lot of teams are very wary about playing around the halfway line. And there's probably enough stats and statistics and analysis, sports science to... England prob- could probably look at their last 50 to 100 games and say, every time we went three phases, five phases, seven phases on the halfway line, this was the outcome and use that to figure out tactics, which is maybe why, on top of the South Africa game, why they're kicking a lot more and risking less in that area of the pitch. My argument would be that actually, if your attack is better, if it's more clinical, more accurate, England created a lot against Wales. I just think either passes check the players, the running lines weren't very accurate enough. If you get that was those... noticeable to me, especially the the double deep ball. I mean, as you know, because you're going back so far and so deep, the person who comes onto the ball has to hit it right at the right time because otherwise you just shuffle out on a deep. And when you've got a stopping ball, which several were, that that just doesn't work. Hundred percent, that is it. So the good work you've done to create space is negated because the pass checks someone, someone's not running onto it at good pace and the defence can recover. So if you get that detail right, you earn the right to play in and around the halfway line because as well, it's 15 against 13. Most teams will drop two, if not three, out of the defensive line. So it should favour the attack. I just think mentally, maybe it's a bit scared, too many errors. So you learn from history and we think, right, we're not going to do it, we're going to kick. But my solution is attack better. Uh, question from Michael. Have Georgia shown enough to be included in the Six Nations at the expense of Italy? No, for me. But... No, not yet, no. I, I think it's great to see them have a run out of games against Tier 1 nations. I, I think there's more to do. You know, if this happens again next year or they're included in more fixtures, I think we need to see a bit more of an improvement to say, right, OK, maybe you merit the opportunity to maybe play for a place. But if they replaced Italy now, the same thing would happen. It, 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 ironically, they are in the same place that Italy were when they were knocking on the door. Because this is what happens. You can perfect all the rote stuff, all the all the things you can do in training, the scrums, all the set pieces, you can do again and again and become very, very proficient at them, which they are. What you can't do is turn creativity on. And it's taken Italy 20-odd years to get to a situation where they've got a bit more about them. And even then, they're still struggling because everyone else is moving on. That's how difficult it is. So... All you would get is a different incarnation of a side which is going to get beaten a lot. And of the two at the moment, Italy are at least showing they've done other bits and pieces. Georgia will get there. That's why I think, as you say, there's got to be some form of exchange. I think every three years, maybe, give them time to alter things. And maybe top versus bottom playoff, I don't know. An automatic right to go there. Um, but you can't just have up and down because it won't work anyway. Right, very quick one. Um, could the Gallagher Premiership benefit from something like the Red Zone on Saturday afternoons? That would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> It'd be costly, that's a problem. Yeah, the it would be costly. Um, it's not impossible. I mean, I definitely like the idea. You know, I mean, at the moment we know BT is showing all the games because of what's happening, but there might be an argument to say, right, OK, we won't show all the games, but if there's a try or if there's a flashpoint, we could switch to it. Um, Ultimately, I think money will will make that decision to see if it's feasible. But you know, we've seen it work for Soccer Saturday, so so why not for for for, for rugby? Yeah. Uh, what do you expect now? We've seen the teams and all the likely teams for Sunday. Routine England win or could France surprise us? I think and I hope that France will throw a bit more at England. Really, actually challenge their defence and play a bit more. You know, I I think you know. Just from an ethos point of view, a philosophy, that's how the French play their rugby. I think they kick second, run first. So we, I hope that England get challenged. Ultimately, they, they won't win trying to brutalise them. No, no, they won't. They won't. I mean, I, I still see England winning because when you're that comfortable with that style of play, it is very difficult and there will be errors which will fuel England, which will dent France's confidence and make them second-guess the way they're going to play. But I would hope there is enough in the French, tack, the French tank, sorry, just to make England think a bit differently, to say, right, OK, maybe this physical game isn't working as well as it has done. Have we got a plan B? And the 2,000 supporters going to be allowed in? They I are. Think, they well, are. I tell you what, that's going to be weird. However, I can tell you, when I first played 
<laughs> for Quinns at Twickenham because um, we were allowed to play there. Um, I played against Lanetley with 2,000 people in the old stadium. So I know a little bit what it's like <laughs> to rattle around in the National Stadium. It's not going to be uh, anything that they're not now used to. So good luck to the people. Good luck to our volunteers who went there. Good luck to, to both teams on Saturday. Obviously being English, we hope uh, to be reporting an English win when we come back. That's all we've got time for uh, this week on Brian Moore's Full Contact. Uh, in association with The Telegraph. Thank you to my co-host, Topsy Ojo, and to all our guests today. If you've enjoyed this episode, why not subscribe and check out some of our previous episodes. And then you can stay up to date on all things sport. You can head to telegraph.co.uk forward slash contact where you can get 30 days access to all the Telegraph's premium sports coverage completely free. But for now, it's goodbye. Full Contact, in association with Mitsubishi Motors, drive your ambition.